Okay, folks, welcome back to In the Studio with Brad. I will give you a quick uh, intro for those of you who maybe stumbled in on random. My name is Brad McDevitt. I am an artist for Gimna Games, a publisher of tabletop games, including the uh, cult classic now uh, BCC RPG. That's the Dungeon Crawl Classics art role-playing game. I've been working with Goodman Games for the better part of 20 years and have racked up in, I've literally lost count the number of projects I worked with for them, but I think at last count it was 180. Can you hear me better this way if I'm actually not, not looking at the monitor and actually like aiming towards the microphone? Uh, those of you who are tuning in for the second time will probably notice a Vast improvement in the quality of the visual and audio. Uh, that's courtesy of my older brother who gifted me some extra equipment that he had lying around in his tech workshop, uh, which is good because I'm about as technically literate as that guy that goes, goes yabba dabba do. So what we're working on this week can you see that, folks? Good. Is a picture of an anti-paladin, or as they are called in 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons, the Black Guard. Black Guard, bad guy, whatever you want to call it. This is going to be appearing in Curse of the Devil Lich, which, for those of you who are new to or don't know Goodman Games history, the Curse of the Devil Lich was originally a module for the Dungeon Crawl Classics back before it became its own system, back when it was just um, supplements for 3.5. And it was explicitly Goobman Games' answer to Tomb of Horrors. In other words, congratulations. Play this play in this module. You may your characters may survive, but uh, don't count on it. I'm not one hundred percent on all the details. I do know that the monsters that I've had to draw for the fifth edition version of Curse of the Devil Lich. Oh yes, I'm sorry, I should have explained that. Now that Dungeon Crawl Classics has its own role-playing line, and through an agreement with Wizards of the Coast, Curse of the Devil Lich is coming back for the 21st century. Bigger, better, and probably with a higher body count. I know the author. Yeah, you can count that. Uh, you may your characters. You might want to have a few, you know, spare character sheets lying around already written out, because I have a feeling you're going to be going through them. So maybe I don't know, maybe five, six, seven, eight spare characters just for safety's sake. Not saying that it's gonna be a bloodbath or anything i just any of you who know tomb of horrors and this is our version of tomb of horrors kids so don't say you weren't warned do 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 so i'm not exactly sure what where this character stands in the overall story, but anything called that is basically considered a version of an anti-paladin cannot be very good. I'm pretty sure this is an NPC class only, by the way, just so you know, at least I hope so, you know. Any villain that uh, has this many skulls on his outfit can't be good. 
And considering my art director was like, oh yeah, that's awesome. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this does not go well, folks. I'm sorry, did I stick my head in the wind? Oh, okay. The okay, the crop marks actually have a very mundane purpose. Each illustration that I do for Goodman Games or for pretty much any of my clients, they're going to be put into the layout of the book at a certain size and certain dimensions. I usually draw one and a quarter size to one and a half times size. So like this image is actually only going to be printed at 4.75, which is about yay. But this tells me where to keep my drawing more or less within. For example, I mean, if I don't know, otherwise I might start drawing details all the way out here. And then the game, the art director has to make the decision of either cropping my artwork down a lot or completely fuss, having to but or have completely screwed up his layout so this like you will see that i actually do extend the image beyond but generally not so far that it might really affect the layout otherwise like he might, the art director might have to go in a little bit and maybe text wrap a little bit around this shield or here, but nothing drastic. Now, like if I were had extended like this guy's sword out to here, I'm not sure he'd be terribly amused because he would then have to text wrap all the way around up here. But this is only going to be once it's shrunk down to print size. It's only going to be maybe that's not even that's not even a quarter of an inch. Does that make any sense? But yeah, they have a they actually have a very mundane purpose. Where was I? Oh yes, I was doing his shield. Oops, sorry. What I have been doing with a lot of these illustrations lately, and I don't really have time to spend to show, show on camera here, though this might be something to do for a future show, is I will get a lot of the inking done, like I'm doing right now, but then I will go back in afterward after getting a high resolution uh, copy onto cardstock and I'll actually paint a lot of these details in. It's actually very time effective and it actually gives a wonderful, more of a sense of like a three dimensionality to the artwork. Hold on, sorry. I know, I think I stick my head, my head in there. Do, 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 do. So this is, like I said, one nice thing with doing the artwork oversized, if I haven't mentioned before, is any artist will tell you they will make mistakes when they're doing stuff. But if you do it oversized, some of those mistakes literally get shrunk down or minimized to the point where you as the artist will be the only person who's aware that they have happened. So I know of some artists 
that it will literally work two and three times size. And I admire people who can work at that scale. I generally can't work more than about twice scale without getting just kind of like, okay, now, great. What do I do with this once I'm done? Because if nothing else, you're then looking at having to, to pay to have it scanned maybe at the local coffee shop or even an actual normal print shop, which can get kind of pricey. Blink, there we go. Looking good, folks. So because he is evil, of course, he's wearing a cloak. But because he is evil, we have to make the cloak nice and ragged. I mean, isn't that a, one of the standard tropes of a fantasy fiction that the more evil the character, the worse their sense of fashion? You know, got to respect the classics, folks. Do, 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 do. There we go. Now, see, what I'll do is now I'm still adding some of these details, even though I'm going to paint over a lot of this stuff. But I want the basic details to still be nice and visible. You want to try and keep your sense of the level of the line that really kind of defines a lot of the classic, you know, fantasy artwork. There we go, hold on just a second. So, There we go. In case any of you are wondering what I actually use for the big version, the color painted version, I'll actually like break out the watercolors. And when I print it out onto the heavy duty paper, then I will print it out as large as I can possibly fit on the paper. So this will probably actually end up being printed out about 10, maybe 10 and a quarter inches tall. And then I will, once I scan it and clean it up and paint it, et cetera, et cetera, then I will scale, scale it back down to print size. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. I think uh, our art director has gotten used to it because, you know, if he opens up his, uh, email and he gets a file that's you know 70 meg it's like oh brad didn't scale the artwork down again i see oops there we go oops sorry a uh, basic old photoshop I used to use Corel Photo Paint until one, one time I was doing a job for another company and I used to use a program called Corel Photo Paint, which is, it, it's, it's analogous to Photoshop, but something told me, it's like, maybe you should try this. And I found some of the different things you can do in Photoshop that you could not do in Corel Photo Paint. And at that point, I just kind of like, okay, I guess I'm an, a Photoshop person now. Um, I still have my Corel Photo Paint, but uh, I rev it up maybe once every three months, 
if I have to access a file that maybe predates my Photoshop days. There we go. Now, one thing I like to do, and I don't know whether, I can't remember whether I talked about this, besides doing them, the originals oversize, I also like to do them extremely large in terms of uh, resolution. Now, I'm gonna take a guess that most of you, everyone here that's watching is at least pretty computer literate. So you'll know what I mean if I'm saying 300 DPI, so on and so forth. I personally like to scan my artwork at 600 DPI, which is about 150 square pixels per inch more than I guess the human eye can actually pick up anyhow. So, but what I, that means I can also basically scan it and print it at pretty much any size I want. And it will still look good. There we go. Actually, I think I did cover this, a lot of this, didn't I? I think I talked about uh, my uh, scanner size res preferences last time. My apologies, folks. So there we go. Now, one thing you always want to do, especially when you're drawing like an evil person, creature, bad guy like this, you want to make things look a bit corrupted. For example, if you notice, his shield has definitely seen better days. Oops, okay. So, now some of this stuff will just, I'll probably wait until I'm painting it, but I should probably do some cracks and such, at least, oh, hold on just a second. I wanna get, let's get his skull finished, okay? Can't leave. Can't leave the guy the guy's skull just kind of floating there un, unfinished, can we now? That's just not polite. There we go. The funky little things I'm doing on his forehead are actually a leftover from some of my early days. I used to be a well, I still am a huge admirer of a French cartoonist named Philippe Drouillet, and I probably just mangled his pronunciation a bit. Uh, some of you may be familiar with his artwork, but probably are, all of you are familiar with the magazine he helped found called uh, Metal Herland, or as it's known here in the States, Heavy Metal Magazine. He was one of the original founders, and Philippe Drouillet was and is known for being an insane detail guy. Now, I can't even begin to really describe exactly how insane his detail was. He would look at a piece like this and go like, really, that's all the detail you're putting in? I'm just not that obsessive. There we go. Yes, I know, I said, Oh, I'm just not that obsessive as I'm drawing individual lines on the teeth like so. But anybody who really wants a completely mind-blowing experience as artwork goes, try and look up his stuff online. It's, it is truly jaw-dropping. I saw a post at one of the DCC groups that was like, man, it wouldn't be great to get Philippe Durier to do a cover. And I'm like, one, 
The guy's like 80 years old. I think he's pretty much retired. Two, I don't think the entire gaming industry has enough money to drag him out of retirement at this point. Just go to gut instinct. Like I said, he's he got his start in the 70s. So you can figure out there about how old he is by now. Come on, kids. By the way, yes, I do this sometimes. I basically jump from one pen to the next to the next with very little rhyme or, rhyme or reason. So oh, this is sorry. something that I'm curious about. Um, okay. What is your creative process as like as far as like coming up with a character? Like you're given like I'll call it as a as a writer does a prompt of sorts. Like you get like this is this kind of character. He kind of looks like this, even if it's vague or super detailed. Like what's your process of like coming up with that character and getting him onto paper? Okay. First, I. Uh get the work order because that's the boring name I always use for it. Uh, then I kind of try to ignore it for as long as possible, usually to about oh, three days after it was actually due. Kidding. Um, I read over the work order, uh, try and start getting a feel like how can I best convey or translate yeah, some their the work order into this. Like this guy is supposed to be a blackguard. He's a villain, so obviously he's going to be ragged, and he's going to have a lot of skulls. And you know, I'll use a lot of dark colors when I I get around to painting him. Um, obviously, that would not work if I were to if it's like. Um, it's a 19th century girl holding a bouquet of flowers. Okay, that's going to require a whole lot of different look. Uh, depending on how historically accurate the image is required, I may Google for, you know, to get ideas for, okay, what kind of hat did this person wear? did people wear during this particular time period? Uh, if it's like a more military thing, it's like, okay, what kind of uniforms did soldiers wear at that particular time? Um, I did a job for Pinnacle Entertainment one time where, all, where that was set in a fantasy version of the Vietnamese, the Vietnam War and that required a lot of referencing, you know. So the first thing I did was I headed off to the local library and I got all the books on military uniforms from the 1960s. And, you know, this is what the Vietnamese soldiers wore. This is what the British wore. And just went from there. But mostly it's, you know, regardless of the amount of refer reference research I have to do, the first step is how is this going to convey the mood of the adventure or the book that I'm, ha I'm illustrating? Does that help any folks? It helped me. Yeah. <laughs> There we go. That's a bit better. Get that ragged look going on some of the belt here. There we go. Yeah, there we go. Now he's looking a little bit more sinister, don't you think? Can you see that? What I'm doing is I'm making the belt 
look a little bit more ragged around the edges rather than ni this nice smooth like this was a brand new belt. I think I should probably do the same down here. There we go. I mean, he's he's an anti-paladin. It's not like I can make him look too evil. There we go. Do, do, do. All right. There we go. What do you think, folks? Does he look evil enough now? Or at least as evil as you can with just, you know, by changing the shape of his belt. There we go. So. Okay, hold on just a second. I have to do a little bit of brain thing brain freeze work here. I got to figure out where I want to start inking next. There we go. Now that's his arm, though you can't, you won't be able to see much of it between the, his cloak and the shield. My original idea was I was going to have him uh, holding like an axe in the other other hand, but then it's like, man, let's do a shield. We can get do more evil things with a shield. There we go. Hold on. Do, 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 do. There we go. Joan says that the uh, thigh belts are rad. And I have to they're, agree. They're rad? Yeah. yeah if you say so. That's one kind of ironic thing with being a commercial artist like this. You do this stuff so much every day, you don't even really think about a lot of it. Um, I have remember an amusing story that a friend of mine told, and this guy was a uh, staff artist at the old uh, FASA Corporation. This was when they were getting ready to... Uh, launched the sh the game shadow run which most everybody knows you know was has been a pretty huge su success and it was a success for no in no small part because of the graphic design anybody who remembers that the original logo remembers it was pretty jaw dropping well jim was telling me one day that that was that was nothing for him, you know. He just walked into work one the, the one morning, and they said, "Hey Jim, we need you to design a logo for the new game." It's like okay, you know, and I assume you know. So he kind of like okay, well, what all we, what all do we want to do with it? Blah, 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 blah. Well, we want to have kind of an Indian theme, and we want to get kind of like science fiction, -y, yada yada yada. And so like okay, whatever. And he went over to his cubic or his office and started working on, he didn't think anything of it. That he was actually like contributing to a healthy chunk of gaming history there. For him, it was just like, this is my job that I'm doing Tuesday morning. Plonk. There we go. Okay. Okay, I started here. No, there is absolutely no rhyme or reason to where I decide to start inking. Um, sometimes I will actually, if I'm feeling really 
like got a little bit of a mental block and I didn't have to do it for something like this, I will actually do a basically a, a square map. And it's like, okay, I'm feeling really, really uninspired to work today, but let's get, whoops, grab the wrong pen. Let's get this one, this one done. Okay, so, okay. Let's get you know, and that's what I'll do, you know, it's just like and each square is like, okay, I got this much of this the illustration done. I can start on the next square. And even then, you know, I'm still kind of like eeny meeny miny mo try and figure out how to kind of like break the slump. Now, if I were smart, and sometimes uh, my wife can tell you, I'm not, I would actually start inking at the very top of the illustration and then work my way down, but it just doesn't, see, it never seems to quite work that way. I guess I work starting from some part of the illustration that strikes me as more visually as visually striking and wanting to be inked, which sounds extremely vague, I know. But I will be the first to admit that sometimes sometimes I'm in the driver's seat when I'm doing this stuff and sometimes I'm over in the passenger seat going like um, would you mind letting me drive for a little while, guys? Because, you know, we got work to do. There we go. Okay, here's another quick trick. And this is being very lazy, I know. But I know that area is going to be black. And actually, I think so is this one. So what I'll do once I get it done completely inked and scanning it. Um, I'll just go in in Photoshop and I'll do a flood fill and I'll just fill that whole area in black point. It's actually faster than trying to ink it normally. And actually you don't have to worry about maybe inconsistencies in the color in the quality of the ink. There we go. Hold on just a second, guys. There we go. Because that, that actually makes it look a little bit more like it's kind of some sort of fabric or something. There we go. This one will be a lot better since I'm not having to retroactively do add uh, the line, the cloth lines and such. Though probably you know, given that this guy is evil, this should probably be like considered like black leather or something. I don't know. There we go. Yeah, I'm going to work on this part real fast. Hold on. Da, 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 da. There we go. Okay, sorry. See, that makes it look a little bit more like cloth and the folds that you normally see in cloth or even actually in leather. There we go. Okay. See?
one thing that I, is actually really frustrating as an artist is you end up having to make a lot of decisions right on the fly. I mean, it looks like even with a fairly tight drawing like this, like, oh, should be fairly simple, but you are still having to like, okay, how do I want to do this line? What line weight? Um, you know, how much, how much detail do you want to put in, in a very area? I personally tend to go in favor of maybe more detail than is actually necessary to get the point across. But I, that's partially because I always loved like artwork by, there was this old guy named Franklin Booth or there's another one, Albert Durer. You're probably familiar with his artwork from The Praying Hands. Both of them love putting in tons of details. I have an old picture by Franklin Booth that's just a car in a country, along a country line and this mass of clouds. And the clouds are so detailed. You could literally just sit there and stare at it for hours on end. And I'm thinking it's like, that's something to aspire to. You know, to make artwork where the viewer can literally just kind of just get lost in the image. You know, there is something to be said for artwork that gets the job done. Boom. But there's also, I feel, you know, and this is probably just, you know, why I feel more affinity for a lot of the older artists, you know, give the viewer something to luxuriate in, basically. There we go. Hold on just a second, guys. Um, a more modern example than, say, Franklin Booth or Albert Durr. Um, if any of you have ever seen artist Bernie Wrightson's edition of his of Frankenstein and if you shouldn't you should look it up Wrightson took like 15 years to do this book but the great thing is there is so much to look at in on in almost every illustration that he did there is one illustration from relatively early in the text that shows the monster reading a book under, and it's sitting on top of a hill under a tree and about two thirds of the illustration is just this unbelievable sea of grass. And he rendered every blade of grass drawing up all the way up here. And you could literally just spend days looking at nothing but his, but Bernie Wrightson's line work in this. Now, I'm not that insane. I'm not that obsessive, regardless of what my wife says, me. But I at least aspire to trying to give something jaw dropping for the client, the reader to look at so that when they come, when, when they're all done, just running through the adventure, they have something that they can go back and go like, wow, look at this illustration. There we go. So. Okay. I mean, I didn't really have to do every little, you know, fold of cloth on 
this guy's cloak but it does give you more of a sense of the reality of the picture too okay let's see how are we doing this do 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 Sometimes, and I don't worry about it quite as much with a piece that I'm going to paint over afterward, I pay a lot more attention to the light direction that the light is coming from. And I try and make a better point for next week's job to be able to show you that this is kind of more of a neutral lighting image where the light is just kind of ambient you know it's not really coming from here or from here or from there where does hold on well anyhow i'm not sure where it is i just recently finished an illustration for Goodman Games where I was very, very conscious of making the light coming from below. But I don't think we want to stop and have me dig through, you know, the pile of originals that have come back from the coffee shop right now. There we go. Anyway, that's one of those little details that you kind of just improvise on the spot. In the sketch, this guy was not wearing a ring, but it, there we go, there we can go. He's kind of vain, so, you know, he's wearing multiple rings. There we go. Like I said, that, that, that was one of those on-the-fly decisions. It doesn't add a lot to the image, but every little detail counts. There we go. I'm going to kind of do a line here and fill this in, make this the edge of the shield kind of stand out a little bit better. Now I think I'm going to jump up here and work on his head. There we go. A little bit more line work down here. One of those things you always have to be conscious of, especially when you're inking, is does the line work follow the shape of the object that you're inking?
this is something that took me a while to learn and actually had to have this kind of bopped into my head by artist Mark Nelson that if you just use a flat cross hatching doom, 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 you can actually harm the quality of the illustrations because it just has a flattening effect rather than reinforcing the design. For example, if you notice, his shield is being held at an angle away from the viewer. So my line work is following the shape of the shield. That probably was not the best explanation. There we go. Okay. We'll fill in a little bit of the black there while I'm thinking about it. Yes, a lot of uh, doing inking a piece is basically like, Oh, I better do that before I forget about it. There we go. Okay, I think we need a little bit more detail work on that skull on his shield. What do you think, folks? I think he needs maybe a few more lines like this. And after all, this is this is a the anti-paladin's heraldic device. So, you know, he's going to want it to be fairly fancy looking. Here we go. That's better, don't you think? Grab the wrong pen. My bad. Do, do, do. There we go. Oops. I'm sorry. Was I, my head in the, the way? I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. Hey, I'm trying. There we go. There we go. Now, there we go. Add a couple of things and stuff like that. That's looking like a properly evil shield now, don't you think, folks? Oops, hold on. One more. Do, 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 do. You can never have too much decay in a picture, don't you think? There we go. This shield has definitely seen some wear and tear. Now. Hold on, I'm thinking. Oh, sorry, my bad. I'm trying to figure out. Okay, well.
Any final questions from the audience? I will try to remember for next week to have a scan of this when it's done inking before I start colorizing or toning it. And then also a version the, ver the version that will actually see print. So you can see how much of a difference adding the tonal work can be. There we go. Some nice dark eyes here. After all, he's evil. Oh, um, in terms of technical skill, I would have to say an artist by the name of Virgil Finlay. He uh, did a lot of work for uh, Weird Tales magazine back in the 1940s and the 50s. Uh, the artist that I think actually has ended up influencing me the most would probably be Bernie Wrightson, simply because he was one, he was one of the first artists that I ever was conscious of seeing back when during the original run of Swamp Thing from DC Comics back in the 1970s. One of the advantages of having older brothers who were all comic book geeks. I got to read a lot of their comics when they were done with them. Oop, sorry. So, but yeah, I grew up on Swamp Thing, Bernie Wrights and Swamp Thing, and Mike Kaluta's Shadow for all. I think 12 issues of it that he did before he basically essentially retired and became a Hollywood producer, or excuse me, a Broadway producer. Um, some of you who are, may be familiar with some of his artwork from White Wolf's Mage comp, uh, role-playing game. He still dips into the gaming industry occasionally. There we go. There we go. Give him some nice hair. Let me read that again. No How old were you when you knew drawing uh, and art was where you wanted uh, where you wanted to make your living? Oh, geez. Um, I think that was pretty much from the word go. Uh, my mom used to complain that basically they didn't dare lay down a piece of paper in my vicinity for fear that I grab it and start drawing on it. There's an amusing story that I don't even remember from kinder, my kindergarten year. They did the standard show and tell stuff, okay? I, of course, took in one of my drawings because, hey, I was awfully proud of hey, how, how I could draw. Well, the teacher didn't believe me. There was no way an eight-year-old kid could draw like this. And of course, being an eight-year-old kid, I was how old? 
I was only kin in kindergarten. Sorry, my mom's my wife was talking to me from the background. I was at most okay. I was probably no later older than actually seven or eight, because this was actually normal kindergarten. But they ended up dragging me down to the principal's office because this little kid is lying to me. I, of course, am bawling my eyes out because, hey, you know, that's what you do when your teacher is accusing you of being a liar. They got my one older brother, for, who was in at the time was in the, like third or fourth grade, to come down. It's like, did he draw this? It's like, yeah, Brad drew this. Oh. And that was pretty much the end of that. I found out many years later that I had an actual art, we had an actual art teacher who any piece of artwork that I didn't lay claim to to take home, she kept an archive of it basically from my basically first grade up through eighth grade when I was no longer, no, through ninth grade, excuse me. At, after, at which time I was no longer one of her students. But yeah, she basically kept an, every artwork of mine that she could for basically what, about six years, seven years? But yeah. So yeah, I have always wanted to be an artist and I will always be grateful to Gibbon Games for giving me the opportunity to do this basically full time. And, you know, and I'm making enough money to get by fairly comfortably. I mean, no one who goes into artwork does it strictly for the money. If they do, they're you know, they, they figure out that they've made a mistake fairly quickly. I consider myself very lucky that I have been able to get multiple jobs over the years where they would pay me for my artwork. There are very few opportunities that don't involve basically working in a video game on a, in a video game company. Something I'm not particularly interested in at this point. Okay, and we are probably just about out of time, aren't we? Okay, well, folks, it has been nice talking to you. I hope I have not bored you too much that you've maybe learned a thing or two. Uh, and I shall see you next week at 8 o'clock at Monday. In, what, in that time, I will be working on some stuff for our upcoming X-Crawl game. So that should be fun. Good night. And I'm going to finish, get back to finishing this piece. Peace out. <laughs>